Hello everyone, today I'm here with Adrian Sullivan. I don't think we've ever talked to each other, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I don't remember ever having done so. <laughs> Hello everybody. <laughs> nice to meet you then. Um, for people who don't know, Adrian uh, played his first Pro Tour at 97, so that's like a really long time ago. But I think you're mostly known for like, you know, building all these like weird decks. You're like really good at the magic game theory. Uh, you also did like some coverage. Uh, what I remember you for is that you actually played your maybe maybe you cannot do that anymore, but you used to play your cards like up front. <laughs> let's let's get to that yeah. later. Uh, how sure, is it going? Sure. How is it going? Don't forget. <laughs> How's it going? Um, well, it's a strange world. Um, the last time I played in person Magic was leading into uh, going to Grand Prix Detroit about a year ago and that was the uh, first event that was cancelled mm -hmm. but as I was getting close to that date I kept getting more and more nervous about going because I couldn't figure out how to be safe from COVID and play in a magic tournament yeah so the last year has been strange because uh, I played a little bit of arena before um, this year but I haven't ever taken a break from magic ever since I started playing oh, really and seriously see yeah, so it feels like a break, mm -hmm. even though you know I'm playing on Arena. It's not Arena is not paper, and mm -hmm. I love paper. So, did you always play around about like the same amount during all these years, or is it like fluctuating? Sometimes you play more, sometimes mm -hmm. you play less. Um, I think the best answer to that is when I figured out that there was a competitive Magic world when I found out there was a pro tour, right? And I'm going to call it a pro tour, even if it's a yeah. championship <laughs> or if it's a, a, a purple dinosaur or whatever they call it. Um, when I found out there was a pro tour, there was always a drive to do that, to, to qualify for that, to, to play in a, a more competitive arena. I've always been a really competitive person and I've had greater or lesser successes at different periods of time, but I've never stopped that drive once I learned about a pro tour. Mm -hmm. So basically your answer is that you like always played a lot. Is that what you mean? Or <laughs> um, Yeah, always played a lot. I mean, when I think there's more or less, I think when um, there are different incentives at different periods of time. So for example, at one period of time, um, I was qualified for events based on my worldwide standing with my DCI rating. Mm -hmm. So I played less then because the oh. incentives meant that you'd play less, you know? And that was a that was kind of a sucky situation where you're like, I want to go play in these events, but the format of it means that if I don't make the top eight of this tournament, that I'm going to lose points. Yeah, I actually think that was the, one of the main reasons why they decided to like not use that system anymore because it just stopped people from from playing. So yeah, yeah, yeah. and that makes sense. It's 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 similar to the arena ladder where you're like, mm -hmm. if you're playing historic, which is my favorite format on arena besides draft. Um, at a certain point, if you're, you know, in the low numbers, you can't even experiment in arena because there's not a good place to play an experimental deck, um, in historic. Whereas at least if you're playing in standard, you can experiment by getting out of the ranked area uh -huh. and play in a non-ranked area and just be like, oh, you know, I've got this idea for a standard goblin stack. No problem. You can try it. No big deal. But if you do the same thing in historic, you might just, you know drop out of the invitation to the next qualifier. I actually didn't know that was the case. I thought that you can just play Historic for fun as well. I didn't know that. There's a, uh, there's the, you can play the Historic events, yeah. but there's no unranked Historic. Like, oh. uh, you're either playing in the Historic events, which are incredibly casual, yeah, or you're playing in ranked events. Mm -hmm. that or makes ranked sense. games, yeah. You're mentioning the fact that you wouldn't be qualified for the invitation and stuff. That means that you're probably still playing quite a bit, right? Like to get like top, <laughs> yeah. top thousand two hundred, it's like like not that easy. You need to spend like a bunch of time doing that, and you need to be pretty good. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, um, the last few months, um, I've finished in the top ten of constructed uh, twice, and the top fifty of constructed like. I think four times mm -hmm. and I've been basically been playing the same deck because it's just really good. And oh, what is the deck? Yeah. <laughs> that was the secret. Jeskai Control. Oh, is that in history? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, I'm 
the person that is the progenitor of the historic build. Some people have taken it and played it. Like I know Wyatt Darby has been having some success with it too. Um, but uh, it's basically if you see the four Valakut, um what's it called? Uh, how am I forgetting the name? Awakening. Um, yeah, I think the, the flip card, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the double faced card. Um, if you see that with like uh, Narset and with uh, oh, Teferi, I remember that deck. deck. Yeah, that deck. I, and then when I played <clears> against <throat> it, I was like, oh, this deck seems really sweet. You were the one who designed that deck. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You're kind of known for like building all these decks. Like sometimes, you know, they're kind of wacky, maybe not as good, but sometimes they end up, end up being really good. Um, was it always like that? Or like, how did, how did that happen? Do you just think that you kind of get it? Or is it just fun for mm. you to make the decks? Or like, what is going on with that? It's a little bit of both. I was talking with my friend, Brian Kowal, and Brian Kowal is pretty well known for having built a lot of decks, especially in the past. Um, he's uh, probably most famous for being the guy that made Ponza. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one of the things he and I were talking about is the area that we came from was near Chicago and the Chicago area was so crazy with how competitive it was in the, in the beginning of the game. But there was a particular group of people that made it specifically difficult. Um, a little group of pros made a team and then in addition to making this team, they made a secondary team and the way that their, their method worked was if you were on the team and you played somebody else on the team, whoever had the higher rating would just automatically win in the tournament. Like oh. so, they, And then if you were on the B team and you played against somebody on the A team and they weren't qualified, the A team player would automatically win. Uh -huh. And so what would happen is the A team would go to tournaments with a deck, a good deck. And the B team would go to the tournament with the deck that would beat the A team's deck. And what the B team got out of it was they got cards from the A team. And then when the A team was qualified, they would, you could still play in qualifiers when you were qualified then. They would continue to enter tournaments to block. Mm. And so many B team players would qualify. And all of the A team members would qualify. And this was like an organized group of good players doing it. And so what the ramifications for that was everyone in that area from the north, from Chicago to Milwaukee, to Madison, down to Indianapolis, they all formed teams when no other area was forming actual organized teams. And this group of people were so good that we tried doing rogue decks, Brian and I, to, to break out of it because the players were better than us. They were just better players. Like, for example, Bob Maher was one of those players and oh. he's in the Hall of Fame. And he was really especially good back then. And one of the things Brian said to me this week, because we just talked about this, was that maybe if we had just knuckled down and played the, the classic good decks of the time, we would have done better. But we were, I think, intimidated by these players. And so we started developing our own decks. And the thing was, is that we were very good at it. <laughs> and so we ended up having a number of successes. And then I created a think tank of players from all over the world to collaborate on decks. And so, for example, Saul Maka, who made The Rock, mm -hmm. um, Mike Flores, uh, Bill Macy, who was one of the people that made Stompy, uh, Jamie Wakefield, who was an old school, like big name back in the day, uh, Mike Donay. I like collected them into a think tank and then we all helped each other win in our respective parts of the country. So it wasn't necessarily the fact that you just had a passion for it. You, you just thought that that gives you a chance to like be these people that you think were better than you. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think that there's still something to that, but it's not as pronounced because the the hive mind makes decks so fast now Yeah. that it is um, often a better uh, thing than just being a, cr a creative on your own. So, for example, the Sultai Ultimatum deck that exists right now, mm -hmm. I was working on something like that and I was like thinking, oh, this is some really good stuff. The Vorn clicks this, that, the other. But at the end of the day, by the time I got to a point where I was starting to think like there was something there, the hive mind had created a very good version. Mm -hmm. And that very good version, um, I hadn't caught up to it yet. And now that I like had done all this work, they were still way the hell ahead of me, you know? Yeah. It, it, it has to be like very different before, right? Like nowadays we have Magic Arena, everything is on the internet. So the value of actually 
on making your own deck isn't actually there. But before, I assume it was different. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not really sure. I didn't really play that much. If you can maybe like talk about it, was it sure. was it like a, you know, because even though I understand that there wasn't that much information, everyone probably knew what like was the best deck, right? So I'm just like curious better mm. if you actually. <laughs> oh, was that was that depends. not the case at all? It it, it depends on what era. Like when uh, I started. Not everyone knew what was the best deck, for example. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a year later, websites had sprung up that helped the people that knew that those websites existed. So, for example, the dojo. Um, if you knew that the dojo existed, you had better information. Before the dojo, it was Usenet news groups, which were like very, very in the weeds of the internet. I mean, basically, like, like a less public version of Reddit. Mm -hmm. And then eventually enough sites existed that like, there was reasonable information, but even then, um, sometimes it wasn't very filled out. So, for example, during the, I want to say, um, Paris qualifier season, season, the Pro Tour Paris qualifier season, this might be uh, slightly incorrect um, in terms of which, but it, regardless, 97, yeah, yeah. 98, right? Mm -hmm. The best deck was a deck that was created by Pete Leher, in uh, the southeast of the United States, and almost no one knew about it. Oh. And to give you an idea, like when I say almost no one knew about it, every event that somebody played this deck with, they won the qualifier. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and only on the very last week of the qualifying season did people um, have a sense of it, but they had a sense of it because they had literally seen it with their eyes and they were trying to recreate it with what they had seen with their eyes. I see. So, so basically, but basically where I was going with my question was that if you were like a really good deck builder, you could have just actually like had a, have an edge over the other people because they were just playing bad decks, right? Or Yeah, yeah, that's a part of it. I mean, there were, um, like the thing about the good deck, like um, knowing what, like a, what a mana curve was, for example, mm -hmm. that was something that people didn't always know. And now that's kind of a truism, right? Like, mana curve is helpful, even for control decks. Like, if you look at the Jeskai control deck that I'm winning with right now, it has a ton of cheap spells. And that's useful because you're playing in a format where everything is so powerful, you have to act quick. Mm -hmm. But that's a, a concept not everyone knew. And very slowly people figured these things out. And as that happened, better information got out. So, um, you know... Wizards of the Coast's official website started printing printing more decks. New websites showed up, like a website called Brain Burst. So now there was the Dojo and Brain Burst. And then there was New Wave Games, and then there was Star City Games. And these other sites started emerging, making it so that there was more. But like the best decks were largely um, passed around person to person or um, on very fringe sites that eventually people got more in touch with. But initially... I mean, you, you'd go to an event, and I remember playing High Tide, the combo deck High Tide yeah. at an event in, like, 1998 or 1999. I forget which year that was. And there was clearly... I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. What was the win condition of a High Tide back in that day? Uh, well, in my deck, uh, the win condition was Stroke of Genius. Oh, so okay. you'd yeah, stroke yeah. them for the kill. Mm -hmm. um, there were some people that used other choices, but that was wrong. Every version that ran Stroke <laughs> as the only kill, that was the correct choice. Okay. Um, but, uh, there was a guy sitting next to me and he clearly had a homebrew deck. I could look at it and I was like, he had created a kind of a zoo deck, if you know what I mean by zoo. Yeah. Um, but it was his own choices. Like I could tell that it was not the normal choices. The choices looked smart and they looked interesting. And I watched him play as I played my match and he finished, um, three turns of magic over the course of his match because yeah. his opponent was memory jar. Mm-hmm. And so they played three turns of magic total for the entire match. Oh. And he was just so dejected and everything. But the thing about his deck was his deck was clearly a homebrew, but he had ideas that made sense. You know, yeah. He just happened to play against somebody that he had no chance against. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. yeah. what are you going to do when you're laying a curd ape and they're going, you know, lotus petal and into it, you know, exploding yeah, I, all over? I understand. I understand. You mentioned the the chess guide a couple of times in in, in historic. Um, <laughs> I'm actually playing a lot of historic now as well because the ne next qualifier is in historic. I'm actually playing blue white, 
which is somewhat similar. So I'm just curious yeah. to know why you think adding the red is better because you know obviously sure. your your uh, mana is a little bit worse. You don't get access to maybe like field of ruin and some of the utility lands. Um, so I'm just curious to to find out. Sure. Um, I think that in almost every matchup, Jeskai is better. Um, where that's not true is um, in the mirror, the blue-white deck has a 50-50 chance, give or take the the innovations it has versus itself. Whereas the Jeskai deck versus blue-white has maybe, it's one of the worst matchups imaginable. Um, it's, it's really bad because we're both doing the same stuff, but you have Castle um, and I don't. Yeah. So like the cast and you have a field and I have no basics. So those two oh, things. You don't have, oh, um, well, that's really bad. Yeah, it's re it's really horrible. Um, but the reason that I think it's better is that the instant removal, especially a lot of the exile removal. So, for example, I'm running um, spray, scorching dragon fire, and anger of the gods. That removal also exiles, so you're a naturally strong opponent versus any of the graveyard recursion decks. So if you're talking about John Sacrifice or any of those decks that run cat food, the cat food decks are usually very easy to beat. And that's mm -hmm. like one of the, the big contenders is the various cat food decks in the format. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think Blue White, they have to rely on the cage in order to make those things work out. And the, the cage is a fragile thing to rely upon. Mm -hmm. Are you playing like Gear Hawk and, and stuff? Because I played against multiple versions of that deck and some some of them don't play that and some of them, them do, so I just want to know. I, I, it's funny because I, um, so I'm, I'm effectively, if I'm going to condense what the deck is, it's effectively a Narset commit to memory deck. Mm -hmm. And so you'd think that Gear Hulk would be really, really good in there. So I, of course, tried Gear Hulk when Gear Hulk was, uh, was, was available and it was fine. Um, and I ended up replacing Gear Hulk with Dream Trawler, and Dream Trawler has been insane. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I'm like, actually playing it myself as well. And it's just like, yeah, yeah I, I, I agree completely. I mean, when you when you uh, are playing against some of those rare decks that run Ulamog, and you're like, come on, Dream Trawler, let me get a Dream Trawler before the Ulamog hits, because you know that you'll beat the Ulamog with a Dream Trawler, and that's like pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy, yeah. Um. Patrick Chapin called you the, the grand, grandfather of magic theory. Um, I'm just curious to, 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 to ask about that a little bit. Uh, do you sure. maybe think that you, you understand the game on like the, the basic level a lot, which also allows you to like build these decks? Uh, or like, would you, would you describe yourself that way? Also, also, I'm just like curious to know whether you think it's possible that you can like understand the game so well, but maybe technically not play as well. I'm not necessarily saying that's the case oh, for you. But, um... No, it's absolutely the case. I, 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 I'm going to say, for example, as a player, I am very prone to mistakes. So a good example of that is, this is as a joke, but it's somewhat true. Mm -hmm. You're like, think really, really hard. <laughs> You've got all these creatures, and you're like, I'll attack with this creature. And then they go, block with this on-the-board uh, creature and use this on-the-board trick, your creature dies. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that happened. So like I'm kind of sometimes mm. prone to those mistakes where I'll get into a tunnel, think my way through it, and then mess up because of something that's right there in front of me. That's something I do. Whereas you know someone like uh, I think one of the great examples for this is Paolo. Like uh, Paolo Vito Dama de Rosa is very very prone to uh, seeing all of those problems and never making that kind of mistake. <laughs> you know, um, you know I, I've I, I've gotten into some clashes with Paolo about theory sometimes. And he has made the the, com the uh, comment about, um, well, he's very good at the game, so he understands it. And I've made the comment like, well, you're a fighter pilot, and I'm, uh, you know, a, a rocket scientist. <laughs> and, like, the thing about it is, he's also, he's also an engineer. He's also very, very smart about the game. He's, like, you know, one of the better thinkers about the game that the game has ever had. But, like, um, I think that one of my strengths has been so, for example, if you understand the concept of tempo, I was one of the people that helped mm -hmm. develop that concept. Uh, I'm not the only person that did, but I was one of the people that helped develop that maybe, concept. Maybe for people who are watching, <laughs> if you can uh, explain a little bit further about that, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So tempo, um, there's a lot of ways in which people talk about tempo, but the proper way to talk about tempo is the idea of the temporary moment where there's an interaction between cards and the way in which the costs of those cards are out of line. So, for example, if I cast, I'll use um, a grizzly bear. 
or any 2-2 creature, for example, and you use a shock or a one-mana removal to kill that, that is an example of you getting um, some value in your time. Now, a lot of times that doesn't matter. Like, let's say you've got that one mana left over and you don't do anything with it. Yeah. Then the tempo matter didn't, didn't matter that much. But on the other hand, if you do something with it, like, for example, I lay that 2-2 two, two for 2, and you lay um, a creature, and then you also shock my 2-2 two, two for 2. Now you've gained an advantage that is on the board. And that stuff matters when you talk about, like, say, in limited where you find yourself not able to do everything you need to do and just barely dying, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that's the basic concept of tempo is the, the exchange of mana in opposition with each other in, in direct moments. Easily said, you basically, one, one, one player just basically pass, pays less mana than the opponent for like an exchange of cards, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very, very succinct way to say it. I'm yeah, sorry, yeah, Gal, of course. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, so like I'm um, the person that came up with what, Mike Flores named the quote philosophy of fire, but which can essentially be um, discussed as the idea of life as a finite resource that can be attacked on its own axis. So, for example, the closer you get to the, the loss of all of your health on whatever vector, so that could be cards, that could be poison, that could be your life total, mm -hmm. the more that tempo starts mattering. So, for example, if you're at two life and I have a lightning bolt in my hand, the interaction with that lightning bolt is the only critical thing that matters, yeah. right? And the ability of you to act, let's say you've got a way to stop that lightning bolt. Like, let's say you've got a counter spell, or let's say you've got a life gain spell. Mm -hmm. Now you still have to play around the fact that I can do this at any time. Whereas if you have 20 life, you don't care about that three points of damage. Mm -hmm. And th this affects tempo because of the need to be able to interact with essentially what's the game under and so the usual three pillars of magic theory are card advantage tempo and uh i call it health uh flora is named it the philosophy of fire which i don't like but you know he he uh he was the first person to publish my my theory stuff about it and he's like he gave me all the credit which i'm grateful for but a philosophy of fire is a terrible that's the name. first time I, i've heard about it i should i should definitely google it right after this interview it definitely, yeah. definitely sounds interesting. Um, well, a good example of it, like pretend, for example, that you have a, a card, you're playing limited, and you have a card that says uh, draw two cards. Okay. Okay, that's a good card, right? And if it says draw two cards, gain two life, those two life mean a lot. But if you just have a card that says gain two life, it probably doesn't mean very much, mm -hmm. you know? And the reason that that draw two guards, gain two life matters is because gaining two life makes you survive longer. So those two cards come into play better. Yeah. So that's why Dream Trawler is so bonkers, right? Because <laughs> you love the, Dream Trawler. The gaining, oh my God. The gaining <laughs> of that life. It's, it's not just that you draw a card because of Dream Trawler. It's that the five life or more that you gain mm -hmm. is so much that that card ends up mattering. Yeah, you, you basically lose tempo by, by spending mana on drawing cards, right? You didn't impact the board and stuff. So the fact that you gain life actually gives you more time to utilize those. So yeah, and what, you're, what you're saying makes sense. Exactly, exactly. Um, one of the last things that I would like to ask about, I, I mentioned it at, in the beginning, I don't want to forget about it, is that you used to play <laughs> with cards up front. Um, when I first saw you, I was like, what is he doing? Like, I, I, I thought that you did it by like mistake and like, you know, you're going to realize and like turn it around, but that just never happened. Um, <laughs> why, did I, why did you do that? Was it like for your opponent so that he can read the cards or like, wh why did you do that? Yeah, it was exactly for that reason, actually. Um, it started out in uh, Tempest Block Constructed because I had some weird cards. Mm -hmm. And um, one of those weird cards was Psychic Vortex, and the other card was Teferi's Realm, both of which have a ton of text on them. And I was a poor Magic player. We were playing on these terrible tables. And what would happen is your opponent would take the card, and they would drag it across the table and turn it around to read it. And I'm like, my rares, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so I started turning it towards my opponent. Mm -hmm. And then what I discovered was that gameplay sped up mm -hmm. because they were always able to read the cards 
and so they never had to do that. They never like because like if you're reading the card and it's a lot of text, they never um, ask, and they were already had read it with, um, at their leisure, you know. And when I discovered that it sped the game up, um, I started doing it all the time because a lot of times I would play slow control decks. Yeah. Not always, because I'm also known for playing aggressive red decks, but like a lot of times I would play slow control decks. So giving myself, this is not an exaggeration, it usually would give three or four minutes to a match, which can be a huge deal when you're playing a slow control deck. Mm -hmm. And um, I played it that way forever. And like Paolo, again, um, he and I both played with the, um, the, the lands in front. Yeah, that um, always, I'm sorry to interrupt, that always seemed kind of weird to me that in one hand you kind of did it for your, uh, you know, in order so that your opponent can read it, but at the same time you had it like further away from them. So it just <laughs> like kind of collides against well, each other. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, the, the car, the lands in front, Paolo and I both did it for the same reason um, very early on in one of the very early rule books. Yeah. That's how, that's how it uh, was, was in the rule book. Mm -hmm. So we, we, when, when we learned at some point, someone was like, see, lands go in front. So that's what we all did. Like he's living in Brazil and I'm living in Wisconsin and North America. And, you know, that's why I started and that's why he started. And, um, yeah, I played that way with the, the lands in front, all the cards facing the opponent until, uh, pro tour dragons of Tarkir when um, I top aided and Hélène Bergeau came up to me during the top eight and she's a friend. I've always been friends with uh, Hélène and Hélène said to me, and I'm going to hope she'll forgive me if she hears this, this with me doing an impression of her. Never again, Adrian. Last time. This is the last time. <laughs> and um, because the coverage team, the viewers hated it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so the, um, after that, I've stopped playing that way entirely because since competitive magic is something I care about, I always want to be practicing the right way. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I think is so funny is that uh, some players have complained that it puts them on edge. But to me, whenever you play online, you're always playing the way that I like, you know, presented it with the cards facing That's you. That's true. I actually so, haven't thought about that. So yeah. I always was like, I don't understand why this bothers you. It's just like you're online. <laughs> but, was that a um, was that a big deal for you that you couldn't play that way anymore, or did you just like solely did it for your opponents and you just like don't really care that much? Um, I, it has been a big deal. Like since then, there have been a couple of pro tours where I know for sure that I wouldn't have timed out if I had had it the oh, other way. Really? Because yeah, and that's only a couple of games. But I mean, you know how it is in a big tournament. Yeah, turning uh turning a win to a draw is horrible. It's basically like lost, right? For the most part. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh, it was awesome talking to you. <laughs> yes. uh, before we uh, finish everything, maybe you want to tell people where, where they can uh, find you on the internet or you, you know anything sure. like that? Sure, sure. Um, if you're interested in seeing some more from me, I just started a Substack, which is currently uh, getting its first article like edited, and that's going to be sullivanlibrary.substack.com. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, in addition to that, if you're looking for me on Twitch, it's a uh, on Twitch, it's Adrian L. Sullivan. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for your time today. If you guys like the video, please click on the like and subscribe button. And uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.